Support for this podcast and the following message come from IBM, who is helping create P-TECH schools, a new education model that prepares students for 21st century careers. Let's put smart to work. Find out how at ibm.com slash P-TECH. This is the TED Radio Hour. Each week, groundbreaking TED Talks. TED Talks. Um, TED. TED. Technology. Entertainment. Design. Design. Is that really what it stands for? <laughs> I've never known the... Delivered at TED heard. conferences around the world. It's the gift of the human imagination. We've had to believe in impossible things. The true nature of reality beckons from just beyond. Those talks, those ideas, adapted for radio. From NPR. Guy Raz. So in the mid-2000s, Kathy O'Neill... My name's Kathy O'Neill. I'm a mathematician, data scientist, and author of Weapons of Math Destruction. Was working on Wall Street as a... Uh, well, Kathy, what was it called again? A hedge fund quant. Let me say that again. A hedge fund... Oh my gosh. A hedge fund quant is... Well, quant is short for quantitative analyst. Oh, okay. I got gotcha. you. Right. So it's somebody who builds algorithms to try to predict the market. Mm-hmm. And in my case, I was trying to predict the futures market. Um, But I entered um, finance in 2007, right as the crisis was unfolding. Apple's under pressure. Uh, Yahoo down 8.5%. Cisco 6.5%. Researchers here working the phone say a lot of their customers are freaked out, waiting to see how low the Dow will go. So ostensibly your job was to make decisions that could help your clients get richer, I guess? I mean, I don't think I actually contributed anything that made them money, which is kind of like a feather in my cap at this point. But at the time, I was like, man... A few years later, Kathy left finance to become a data scientist, crunching numbers that were used by companies to help them target ads to consumers. Basically the same stuff. But instead of predicting markets, my new job was to predict people. So I, I was, you know, there I was as a data scientist. I was kind of like, oh, I'm not, at least I'm not messing up the world anymore. Um, but, you know, what I realized is that I was separating people with my my new algorithms. I was separating people by class Hmm. and often by race. Yeah. And I was giving some of them opportunities and others of them I was denying opportunities. And I was doing, you know, relatively benign things. But what I realized was like, that's what data science does. Hmm. We separate people into winners and losers. And sometimes those, what they win is really important to them. Sometimes it's a mortgage or a credit card or a job or prison time. Yeah. And the more I learned, the more I said, wow, this is a real, this is a real problem. This, these algorithms are placeholders for these very, very difficult discussions that we don't really want to have as a society. So we're sort of hiding them in these, in these black boxes. How, how ubiquitous is the use of algorithms now in, in like everyday life in, in the world, in, in the U.S., wherever? How, I mean, are algorithms used all over the place now? So let me just take an average person. Uh, the average person spends, you know, some amount of time on Facebook yeah, or Twitter right. or Google. And the and the answer is absolutely algorithms are completely controlling their experience and their atmosphere and their environment. But, you know, besides that, most of the time, the algorithms that I worry about the most, they happen at certain specific junctures of people's lives where critical decisions are being made. Where do I go to college? Where do I get a job? Like, how do I get a mortgage? And so you should think of these as like bureaucratic decisions that other people make about you. And at those moments, it's almost always algorithmic at this point. On the show today, can we trust the numbers? We're going to explore the ups and downs of relying too much on data and hear ideas about how our faith in data, statistics, and algorithms can sometimes lead us astray. And as we heard from Kathy O'Neill, those algorithms she mentioned weren't just predicting outcomes. In some cases, they were actually causing them. Because one of the things is they all kind of act the same. They're not exactly the same. But when I talk about like algorithms that sort through resumes or algorithms that personality tests or algorithms that decide who is a good insurance risk. They're very, very similar to in different companies. So they're sorting people in the same kind of way. And if you think about what that does on a society level, 
It's sorting winners and losers in the standard, old-fashioned way that we've been trying to get over, that we've been trying to transcend through class, through gender, through race. And it's against the American dream. You know, it is actually a social mobility problem. Hmm. And that's what I realized. I was like, I'm working on this. I left finance. And now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm sort of codifying inequality. So this is the thing. There is some data, a lot of data, a lot of historical data that is right, that is accurate, and that we have to use, right? I mean, look, it's it's really important to understand the difference between accuracy and fairness. So it used to be that insurance, life insurance companies made black men pay more for life insurance than white men simply because they were going to die sooner. That lasted for a long time before the regulators in question were like, wait a second, that's racist. And it's racist because we have to ask the question, why? Why are black men living less than white men? And is that their fault that they should take responsibility for and they should pay for? Or is that a problem that society itself should take on and fix? So it wasn't an inaccurate fact that black men lived less time. But the question was, how should we deal with that? And that's a question of fairness. And it's a question that we all have to grapple with together. And many of these questions are of that nature. So yes, it's true that that people who live in this zip code are more likely to default on their debt. Does that mean we don't loan them any money? Or do we make a rule that people of this age who have a job, who finish college or whatever, what do we decide is fair? And that's a really hard question. Data science has done nothing to address that question. So wh- why is it that when most of us hear the term data science, we think, yeah, yeah, that, that must be right? Well, I think most of us are intimidated by what I call the authority of the inscrutable. Yeah. If we don't understand something, we, we don't feel like we're expert enough to complain about it. I've seen it happen. I mean, I, I'm a mathematician. I have a PhD in math, you know. And when I was in school for my PhD, I would sit next to somebody on the airplane and they'd say, oh, wow, you must be really smart. Mm. I, I hated math in junior high. You know, they'd always say that. Yeah. And they would like defer to me for all sorts of ridiculous things simply because I'm, a good, I'm good at math. Mm. So I've seen it happen in real time. But I, I, I've also seen people use that authority to make people stop asking questions. Which, which you can do. You can like bully people with with data. It's a it's a form of bullying. And statistics. You could bully them and say, look, this is what it says. I call it math washing. Math washing. Yeah. It's yeah. like, you know, look, don't look behind this curtain. It's like math splaining. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to be math splained. No, you don't. You want no. you want to see the evidence. Show me evidence that this data science thing works. Show yeah. me show me who, for whom does this fail? Does this fail more for women than for men? Does this fail more for African Americans than for white? Does this fail more for people with mental health status than for others? Like, show me the data. And until you've shown me the evidence that this works, why should I trust it? Why should I think it's fair? I mean, there's essentially the people who have access to the data and that can decide how that data is presented have a tremendous amount of power. It's about power. Yeah, it really is. It's more than you think. It's it's about power because they get to decide what experiment. It's about power because they get to math math explain. It's also about power because they get to decide what success looks like. Here's Kathy O'Neill on the TED stage. This is Roger Ailes. He founded Fox News in 1996. More than 20 women complained about sexual harassment. They said they weren't allowed to succeed at Fox News. He was ousted last year, but we've seen recently that the problems have persisted. That begs the question, What should Fox News do to turn over another leaf? Well, what if they replaced their hiring process with a machine learning algorithm? That sounds good, right? Think about it. The data. What would the data be? A reasonable choice would be the last 21 years of applications to Fox News. Reasonable. What about the definition of success? Reasonable choice would be, well, who's successful at Fox News? I guess someone who say, stayed there for four years and was promoted at least once. Sounds reasonable. And then the algorithm would be trained. It would be trained to look for people to learn what led to success. What kind of applications 
led to, historically led to success by that definition. Now think about what, that would, what would happen if we applied that to the current pool of applicants. It would filter out women because they do not look like people who were successful in the past. Algorithms don't make things fair if you just blithely, blindly apply algorithms. They don't make things fair. They repeat our past practices, our patterns. They automate the status quo. That would be great if we had a perfect world, but we don't. And I'll add that most companies don't have embarrassing lawsuits, but the data scientists in those companies are told to follow the data, to, to focus on accuracy, Think about what that means. Because we all have bias, it means they could be codifying sexism or any other kind of bigotry. I think about it like this, like, you know, I'm sure, and I'm not, I'm not a historian, but like, I'm sure that when cars first came out, people were just like so floored by them. They were like, oh my God, cars are the best. And they didn't notice that cars, you know, sometimes wheels fell off and, and sometimes people got killed by spiky things in the car that didn't need to be so spiky when they got into an accident or fell off the road or something. And it was only after quite a while that we started insisting on airbags and bumpers and and safety. It wasn't some magical experience. It was an actual fight by consumer advocates. Um, so I feel like we're pre-consumer advocates in the world of algorithms. We are still driving around without a speedometer, without bumpers, and without airbags, assuming that these algorithms work perfectly. Um, the difference between car safety and algorithmic safety is that it's much harder to see when people's lives get ruined via algorithm than it was to see that people died in a car crash. Car crashes are like public tragedies. Everyone can see a car crash. But when somebody gets denied a job, especially in this situation where they don't often don't even find out why, it's really, really difficult to say, hey, that's a failure of the algorithm. Let's fix it. But I mean, given that that algorithms are fed by statistics, how do you how do you feel about statistics? Are you are you skeptical of, of, of those? Not at all. No. OK. I'm not at all skeptical of statistics. In fact, I mean, let me go, get bigger. I'm I feel like science is our only hope. And I feel like what we've done is we've created a field we call data science, but there's no science in it. We have not demanded evidence. The sort of hallmark of science is that it needs to be tested and testable, and we need to see the evidence, and we need to test every assumption. And we have just haven't done any of that. We've just been driving blind on our Model T algorithms. Kathy O'Neill. She's a data scientist and author of the book, Weapons of Math Destruction, How Big Data Increases Inequality and Threatens Democracy. You can see her full talk at TED.com. On the show today, can we trust the numbers? I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Hey, everyone, just a quick thanks to our sponsor, Marriott Hotels. Discover what happens when ideas have a place to grow. Together, Marriott Hotels and TED are inspiring new perspectives through curated TED Talks available at Marriott Hotels around the world. Support also comes from Little Black Stretchy Pants, the recently released memoir from Lululemon Athletica founder Chip Wilson. Notorious for both his business acumen and marketing brainpower, Wilson shares lessons learned along the way to building a billion-dollar business. From public guffaws to ringing the closing bell at NASDAQ, Wilson shares how a cultural trend created an idea for a business that spurred one of the greatest changes in the history of how we dress. So head to Amazon.com to pre-order your copy today. It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. And on the show today, can we trust the numbers? Ideas about our growing faith in data, algorithms, and statistics to predict outcomes. Joy, normally we have a criteria for people who are on the show, so we're just making a special exception for you. Normally, you have to be the following to be on the show. A Rhodes Scholar, a Fulbright Fellow, <laughs> an Anita Borg Scholar, an Astronaut Scholar, plus you also have to win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> I fell short. I appreciate the exception, though. <laughs> this is Joy Bulamwini, and okay, she might not have a Nobel Prize, but she does have all those other awards. She's also a graduate researcher at the MIT Media Lab. 
and I am the founder of the Algorithmic Justice League. So my personal mission is to fight algorithmic bias. Yes, the Algorithmic Justice League, which is a group of computer scientists and coders who try to raise awareness about the social problems that exist in algorithms. It's something Joy recently demonstrated by using a basic webcam and facial analysis technology. And it's a kind of technology you might find when you upload a picture on social media. And so what I do is I sit in front of the camera, hoping for my face to be detected. And I have pretty dark skin. So I'm sitting there with my face, dark skin, there's no detection. Then I pull on my friend's face who has much lighter skin than I do, she's Chinese, and you see that her face is immediately detected. So then I switch back to my face, dark skinned and gorgeous, not detected. I put on a white mask, and after I put on the white mask, that's when I'm detected. And I wanted to show this as an example that in the same conditions, right, a typically lit office, we were having a different experience. So facial recognition software, this is like the stuff that, like how Facebook and Google know who to tag and and photos and stuff. You're saying that that a lot of the software doesn't detect black faces? Absolutely. Hmm. This is the kind of technology that you're starting to see in things like the uh, iPhone 10 with Face ID, of course, with Facebook, with the auto tagging and so forth. So this kind of technology is being built on machine learning techniques and machine learning techniques are based on data. So if you have biased data in the input, and it's not addressed, you're going to have biased outcomes. Joy explained more about this from the TED stage. Unfortunately, I've run into this issue before. When I was an undergraduate at Georgia Tech studying computer science, I used to work on social robots. And one of my tasks was to get a robot to play peekaboo. The problem is peekaboo doesn't really work if I can't see you and my robot couldn't see me. Not too long after, I was in Hong Kong on a tour of local startups. One of the startups had a social robot, and they decided to do a demo. The demo worked on everybody until it got to me, and you can probably guess it. It couldn't detect my face. So what's going on? Why isn't my face being detected? Well, we have to look at how we give machines sight. Computer vision uses machine learning techniques to do facial recognition. So how this works is you create a training set with examples of faces. This is a face, this is a face. This is not a face. And over time, you can teach a computer how to recognize other faces. However, if the training sets aren't really that diverse, any face that deviates too much from the established norm will be harder to detect, which is what was happening to me. Joy, you gave this talk a couple years ago, um, but, but this problem still still exists. Yes. And it's even more urgent now because there's this assumption that we've arrived. So, for example, in 2014, Facebook released a paper called Deep Face that showed a major breakthrough for facial recognition technology. They achieved 97.35 percent accuracy on the gold standard benchmark for facial recognition at the time. Hmm. But we always have to ask with these types of technologies, with AI, who's included, who's excluded. Hmm. So now I just told you 97.35% accuracy. Sounds great. Guess what the gender ratio was? I don't know, 50-50? It's gold standard, you'd think 50-50. Yeah. (laughs) It was 77.5% male. Wow. (laughs) And then a demographic breakdown was... um, I want to say 80.5% white (laughs) for this gold standard benchmark. Wow. So now when you know that the gold standard has these skews, when you see something like 97.35% accuracy, we've made a major breakthrough, you start to get a better understanding of exactly which faces, right, this breakthrough applies to and which ones might not be included. And it's a reflection of people who are in positions of power to mold artificial intelligence. And that's a very limited group right now. 
Across the U.S., police departments are starting to use facial recognition software in their crime-fighting arsenal. Georgetown Law published a report showing that one in two adults in the U.S., that's 117 million people, have their faces in facial recognition networks. Police departments can currently look at these networks unregulated using algorithms that have not been audited for accuracy. Yet we know facial recognition is not fail proof and labeling faces consistently remains a challenge. You might have seen this on Facebook. My friends and I laugh all the time when we see other people mislabeled in our photos. But misidentifying a suspected criminal is no laughing matter, nor is breaching civil liberties. Law enforcement is also starting to use machine learning for predictive policing. Some judges use machine-generated risk scores to determine how long an individual is going to spend in prison. So we really have to think about these decisions. Are they fair? And we've seen that algorithmic bias doesn't necessarily always lead to fair outcomes. So how do you stop this? I mean, how do you fight algorithmic bias? So I feel like the minimum thing we can do is actually check for the performance of these systems across groups that we already know have historically been disenfranchised, right, in the first place. I I feel like that's a minimal thing. Then we also need to think about what are steps to take to address the bias as well, right? You know, this is why I think it's critically important we have diverse people participating in the creation of the future. And that means having diverse people shaping the priorities as well as developing the technology. So here's what here's I wonder. Can, I mean, is it possible to create a completely unbiased algorithm? It depends on what the task is, but I think the question I think about more so is knowing that we are deeply biased, even in our language, our classification systems, etc. How do we create systems that work well for humanity, but also how do we keep ourselves honest as we're making progress, right? So it's like if you're talking about perfecting a democracy, will there be a perfect democracy from what I look and see? Probably not, you know, but you're trying to create a more perfect union in some way. So in trying to create more perfect AI, you you strive for these ideals of inclusion. You want to mitigate bias, etc. But we also have the humility to know that being fallible, being human and being humans who embed our fallibility into the machines we create, we're not necessarily going to be perfect all the time, but we have to try to do our best and continue to improve. And if we exclude people and we limit people's humanity, right, which is what happens when we have algorithmic bias that's not addressed, we really limit the potential for all of us in the long run. Joy Buelmini, she's a computer scientist and the founder of the Algorithmic Justice League. You can see her full talk at TED.com. Can I ask you a, a philosophical question? Sure. Is the right or the correct statistic an objective truth? Whoa, that's a very good question. This is Alan Smith. I'm the data visualization editor at the Financial Times. And Alan says... Unlike an algorithm, a statistic can be a more reliable measure of what's true. But in a certain sense, even that doesn't matter. People have this idea, this kind of binary notion that it's either right or wrong. But what's really interesting is seeing people's reactions to it about how they're going to use that information. Before Alan worked in journalism, he spent over a decade working for the UK's Office of National Statistics. So that's kind of like the UK equivalent of the Census Bureau. And while he was there, he noticed something that really intrigued him. When we do a census, the whole point is to try and kind of capture everybody yeah. in the census so we know more about ourselves. And it just struck me how little we knew about ourselves when I would talk to people about my job and describe the sort of data we were working with. It never really seemed to marry up with other people's views. And that's that's really interesting. It always fascinated me that, that the way that people were perceiving the world was different from reality. 
So, for example, Alan says that one annual survey by a UK polling firm has captured this difference pretty well, the difference between perception and reality. Alan described the results from the TED stage. They did a survey of over 1,000 adults in the UK and said, OK, for every 100 people in England and Wales, how many of them are Muslim? Now, the average answer from this survey, which was supposed to be representative of the population, was 24. British people think 24 out of every 100 people in the country are Muslim. Now, official figures reveal that figure to be about five. They asked Saudi Arabians, for every 100 adults in your country, how many of them are overweight or obese? And the average answer was just over a quarter. The official figures show, actually, it's nearer <laughs> to three quarters. And I love this one. They, they asked it in Japan, they said, for every 100 Japanese people, how many of them live in rural areas? And the, the average again, this is the average, 56 out of every 100 Japanese people lived in rural areas. The official figure is seven. So extraordinary variations and surprising to some, but not surprising to people who've read the work of Daniel Kahneman, for example. Him and his colleague Amos Tversky spent years researching this disjoint between what people perceive and the reality, the fact that people are actually pretty poor intuitive statisticians. And there are many reasons for this. Individual experiences certainly can influence our perceptions, but so too can things like the media reporting things by exception. Kahneman had a nice way of referring to that. He said, we can be blind to the obvious, so we've got the numbers wrong, but we can be blind to our blindness about it. And that has enormous repercussions for decision-making. I mean, you can imagine that this might have really big consequences. Like, if people perceive, for instance, that that the percentage of Muslims in the UK is so much higher than it is in reality, that could determine how they vote. Exactly. And, and then, you know, that for me, that's just astonishing because that's not exactly information that we've been trying to hide. Hmm. That's information that had been broadcast for a good year or two uh, after the census, and yet people still had their own impression. Why do you think so many people trust their intuitions and their lived experiences more than a statistic that is quantifiable, reliable, and, for lack of a better word, true. Um, why do people trust their intuitions? I think because it keeps them alive, right? Like, um, <laughs> it does what it needs to do, which is makes you run away from a lion before you've even realized there's a lion running at you, right? Like, so intuitions, without being precise, can be very, very valuable. Um, but I think that people find it difficult to relate to statistics when they're about the aggregate. Yeah. Right? Like, no no one actually thinks of themselves as one of 65 million people. Right. You're probably thinking of yourself, your family, your colleagues, the people that you interact with regularly. And that's a very different world from the one that's generally reflected in official statistics. So at the statistics office, while this was all going on, I had a, an idea which was... If we reframed the questions and say, how well do you know your local area, would your answers be any more accurate? Um, so I devised a quiz. How well do you know your area? It's a simple web app. You put in a postcode, and then it will ask you questions based on census data for your local area. There are seven questions. Each question, there's a possible answer between 0 and 100. And at the end of the quiz, you get an overall score between 0 and 100. And so the first question is, for every 100 people, how many are aged under 16? You drag the slider to highlight your icons and then just click Submit to answer. And we animate away the difference between your answer and reality. Okay, so, so your theory here was that people would know their own neighborhood better, like, you know, like the place where they live and work and see people every day, that their perception of their local area would be more accurate. Yeah, that's right. And, and I mean, in fact... It turns out people weren't any better with their local areas. You know, they just weren't. And we found that very many people were overestimating, even in their local area, things like the proportion of people who were Muslim. Um, they were amazed at how many people did or didn't own a car in their street, kind of really simple stuff like that. Hmm. The one that I found really interesting was there. Were, I actually thought the demographics, like how old or young your area was, I thought people would nail that. Um, but it turned out lots of people got that wrong too. And it was really interesting to get that kind of yeah. their view of their neighbourhood relative to the, the official figures. It turns out the reaction was, um, uh, was more than I could have hoped for. 
it was a long-held ambition of mine to bring down a statistics website due to public demand. <laughs> Uh, this URL contains the words statistics, gov, and UK, which is three of people's least favorite words in a URL. Um, and the amazing thing about was this was that the website came down at quarter to 10 at night because people were actually engaging with this data of their own free will, using their own personal time. Um, I was very interested to see that we got something like quarter of a million people playing the quiz within the space of 48 hours of launching it. And it sparked an enormous discussion online on social media, which was largely dominated by people having fun with their misconceptions, which is something that, you know, I, I couldn't have hoped for any better in some respects. It's really because statistics are about us. If you look at the etymology of the word statistics, it's the science of dealing with data about the state or the community that we live in. So statistics are about us as a group, not us as individuals. And I think as social animals, we share this fascination about how we as individuals relate to our groups, to our peers. Do you think that the better we get at measuring things and, and coming up with reliable statistics, the more sort of progressive we become as, as humans, that, that, that we just continue to move forward and make better decisions? Um, I think it, better data is something that is a vital ingredient for progression. But I think changing the way that people interact with data, for me, is absolutely critical. And in fact, on that point, the thing I think that was really interesting was that I had quite a few teachers write to me and said, thank you, finally, they said, now we've got a way of trying to introduce younger children to why we even bother with this statistic mm. stuff. And they said what they'd done is they'd got these children in their classes to, to do the quiz for the areas that they live they were then encouraged to discuss the differences. Hmm. And just that reasoning with data, I think what we've really got to think about is how we start to promote things like statistical reasoning as an integral part of our education. And, I mean, I think my interest originally in going to work for the statistics office was this idea that, that there was some public good to be derived from it. And I think people are now hoping that we're going to find better ways of applying it in future. Alan Smith is the data visualization editor at the Financial Times. You can see his entire talk at TED.com. Today on the show, can we trust the numbers? I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Hey, everyone. Just a quick thanks to two of our sponsors who helped make this podcast possible. First, to LegalZoom, who can help you make this the most memorable year to date. Finally, get serious about launching and running your business. Square away your family's future with the right estate plan. You can do all this and more with LegalZoom. They're not a law firm, but they have the resources to keep you on the right path, including advice from their network of independent attorneys. Go to LegalZoom.com today and get special savings when you enter Radio Hour in the promo box at checkout. Thanks also to Rise and Grind, the new podcast from Damon John. Before Damon John was a co-star on ABC's Shark Tank, he was a young boy from Hollis, Queens, sewing hats by hand and selling them on the street. Rise and Grind gets entrepreneurs like Gary Vaynerchuk and Tyler, the creator, to share secrets to outperforming and outworking your way to the top. Subscribe to Damon John's new podcast, Rise and Grind, in Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. I'm Ophira Eisenberg. Join me on NPR's Ask Me Another as we challenge contestants and celebrities to nerdy word games, music parodies, and ponderful trivia. Find us every week on the NPR One app and wherever you listen to podcasts. It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. And on the show today, can we trust the numbers? And if you just watch like an hour of cable news, 228,000 net new jobs were created. That middle fifth gets one and a half percent of the total. You get a lot of numbers thrown at you. 30,000 undocumented immigrants with criminal records released last year. The uninsured rate dropped to below 10 percent, the lowest in history. From a lot of different sources. 36 percent of Americans think global warming is a serious threat. The top 1% gets 8.5% of the benefit. And while some people might have too much faith in the numbers, 
this kind of barrage makes other people really skeptical. So I think the reason why people are more distrustful of statistics is because they feel more alienated by them than they do with other sources of information. They feel that it's beyond them. They feel that they can't do it. And, and very often it's just tempting to say, oh, whatever, it's probably a lie. This is Mona Chalabi. She's a data editor for The Guardian newspaper. Basically, my job is to take a story and to kind of zoom out and provide context for readers. And the thing that excites me about data is just the scale of it, right? Like data gives you a scale, it gives you a new frame of understanding. But very often the way that statistics can be misleading is by simply changing what that context is. Hmm. And I think people don't necessarily feel equipped to say, I don't really understand where these numbers came from. But they also know that that plays a role. And I think that's part of where the skepticism, where the statistics comes from. And Mona says we should be skeptical because there are a lot of bad numbers out there. But that means it's kind of up to us to learn how to spot the good statistics from the bad ones. So if you get to the bottom of a piece and you think, I don't really get it, ask questions. Ask how they gathered that data. What is the base number? How many people are we talking about here? For any claim. Anyone can do this. You don't have to be a geek or a nerd. You can ignore those words. They're used by people who are trying to say they're smart while pretending they're humble. Absolutely anyone can do this. Mona Chalabi picks up the idea from the TED stage. So I want to give you guys questions that will help you be able to spot some bad statistics. So can you see uncertainty? Now, one of the things that's really changed people's relationship with numbers, and in fact, even their trust in the media, has been the use of political polls based on national elections in the UK, Italy, and of course the most recent US presidential election, using polls to predict electoral outcomes is about as accurate as using the moon to predict hospital admissions. Now, seriously, I used actual data from an academic study to draw this. There are a lot of reasons why polling has become so inaccurate. Our societies have become really diverse, which makes it very difficult for pollsters to get a really nice representative sample of the population for their polls. People are really reluctant to answer their phones to pollsters, and also, shockingly enough, people might lie. But you wouldn't necessarily know that to look at the media. For one thing, the probability of a Hillary Clinton win was communicated with decimal places. How on earth can predicting the behavior of 230 million voters in this country be that precise? And then there were those sleek charts. See, a lot of data visualizations will overstate certainty, and it works. These charts can numb our brains to criticism. When you hear a statistic, you might feel skeptical. As soon as it's buried in a chart, it feels like some kind of objective science, and it's not. The second question that you guys should be asking yourselves to spot bad numbers is, can I see myself in the data? Because part of the reason why people are so frustrated with these national statistics is they don't really tell the story of who's winning and who's losing from national policy. It's easy to understand why people are frustrated with these global averages when they don't match up with their personal experiences. The point of this isn't necessarily that every single data set has to relate specifically to you. The point of asking where you fit in is to get as much context as possible. OK, so the final question that I want you guys to think about when you're looking at statistics is how was the data collected? And I know this is tough because methodologies can be opaque and actually kind of boring, but there are still some simple steps you can take to check this. One poll found that 41% of Muslims in this country support jihad, which is obviously pretty scary and it was reported everywhere in 2015. Now, when I want to check a number like that, I'll start off by finding the original questionnaire. And it turns out that journalists who reported on that statistic ignored a question lower down on the survey that asked respondents how they defined jihad. And most of them defined it as, quote, Muslims' personal, peaceful struggle to be more religious. Only 16% defined it as violent holy war against unbelievers. Now, this is the really important point. Based on those numbers, it's totally possible that no one in the survey who defined it as violent holy war also said they support it. Those two groups might not overlap at all. It's also worth asking how the survey was carried out. This was something called an opt-in poll, which means that anyone could have found it on the internet and completed it. There's no way of knowing if those people really even identified as Muslim. And finally, there were 600 respondents in that poll. There are roughly 3 million Muslims in this country, according to Pew Research Centre. That means the poll spoke to roughly one in every 5,000 Muslims in this country. That, that survey 
It was conducted by a polling organisation called Woman Trend. Mm -hmm. And Woman Trend was set up by a woman called Kellyanne Conway, Mm. who is now part of the Trump administration. Yeah. And so understanding the incentives that people might have behind those data gathering organisations to reach certain conclusions is really important too. And again, for any statistic, it's really important to ask, how was it gathered? But I mean, we're so inundated with so many statistics. I'm not sure if, you know, most of us have the tools or the patience or the context to differentiate between the good ones and the bad ones. It's quite funny. I think people think of numbers as being a very intellectual thing, but there are a lot of feelings wrapped up in it. So, you know, people literally have nightmares about being back in math class. (laughs) <laughs> and I think that actually people do have the tools. I, I haven't met anyone who doesn't have the intelligence to be able to kind of ask these questions. A lot of it is about feeling intimidated by the numbers and feeling like you can't question them. So on the one hand, it seems like you're saying, hey, be skeptical. Like you should not really trust statistics. But on the other hand, you're saying, well, don't count them out either. Yeah, absolutely. Skepticism is an inherently healthy and positive thing to have. But don't use that scepticism to just write numbers off. Just channel that scepticism to ask questions and feel empowered about the numbers that are available to you. That's Mona Chalabi. She's a data editor for The Guardian newspaper and host of the new podcast, Strange Bird. You can hear her entire talk at TED.com. So on the show today, we've been asking, can we trust the numbers? And of course, there are many, many examples when numbers are crucial. When Ann Milgram was just starting out as the attorney general of New Jersey back in 2007. I was, you know, 35 years old at the time and really eager to, uh, you know, sort of work on high level criminal justice issues. She turned her attention to not only one of the deadliest cities in her state, but also in the country, Camden, New Jersey. It's a very unique power, but the New Jersey AG is the chief law enforcement officer. And so the AG can take over any police department, any case, any prosecutor's office. And of course, on day one, I was then as attorney general in charge of the most dangerous city in America. Wow. So you, when you became attorney general, you also became the police chief, basically, for yes, Camden. Yes, exactly. And I went to this ComStat meeting um, where the senior police commanders come in the room and they are grilled by the leadership of the department on trends in crime, on police responses to crime. And so I went to see this in Camden and, you know, there was a guy there with a a pad of yellow stickies and a black Sharpie marker. And the first officer said, we had a, you know, robbery last week on such and such a street corner, no suspects. And the guy wrote it on the yellow sticky and put it on the wall. Um, Mm -hmm. And on the wall was a map of Camden. And so we were sort of loosely mapping where our crime was. And then the next senior officer said, you know, we had a homicide, no suspects. And this went on for about two hours. And at the end, we had a wall filled with yellow stickies but virtually no idea of where the next crime would happen or how we could reduce crime. I saw for the first time that the systemic failure is that without data and without information, a system that's run really subjectively based on our gut and our instinct, we don't know what we're doing, we don't know whether we're doing it well, and we don't know whether or not we can do it better. So to radically change things, and drew inspiration from an unlikely place, the book and later the movie... Moneyball. There is an epidemic failure within the game to understand what is really happening. And decided to moneyball the criminal justice system in Camden, New Jersey, using data and statistics. And this leads people who run Major League Baseball teams to misjudge their players and mismanage their teams. When you think about baseball scouts, what they did solely back in the day was they would use their instinct and their judgment and they would go out and basically say, okay, this guy's going to be great, this guy's not going to be great. And then you have Moneyball where you've got the Oakland A's coming in and basically saying, look, when we do the statistical analysis, we find out that what really matters is on-base percentage. That's how teams score runs, that's how teams win. And so in criminal justice, the system is remarkably similar. It is a very subjective system. 
um, where the police officer, the prosecutor, the judges are making decisions based on their experience and instinct. So you decide to do this in, in New Jersey, in criminal justice. How? What did you do? We did a number of things. We pulled data to understand where the police officers were being deployed, to understand where the crimes were happening. We started to look at who the next shooters were, at what data and information we had. We put GPS on the police cars so at every moment we could understand which car was closest to the 911 call. We literally pulled every piece of information that we had access to in the department, and we started to gather new forms of of data and information as well and to build systems around that to track patterns and changes in crime so we would know when a neighborhood was heating up, when it was cooling down, and where we should start thinking about we should be spending our time and our effort. Here's more from Ann Milgram on the TED stage. It worked for the Oakland A's, and it worked in the state of New Jersey. We took Camden off the top of the list as the most dangerous city in America. We reduced murders there by 41%, which actually means 37 lives were saved. And we reduced all crime in the city by 26%. We also changed the way we did criminal prosecutions. So we went from doing low-level drug crimes that were outside our building to doing cases of statewide importance on things like reducing violence with the most violent offenders, prosecuting street gangs, gun and drug trafficking, and political corruption. After Anne finished serving her time as attorney general, she went to work for a foundation to tackle bail reform. And she used the same kind of moneyball approach that she used in Camden. We have 12 million arrests every single year. Less than 5% of all arrests are for violent crime. Yet we spend $75 billion, that's B for billion, dollars a year on state and local corrections costs. Right now, today, we have 2.3 million people in our jails and prisons. And we face unbelievable public safety challenges because we have a situation in which two-thirds of the people in our jails are there waiting for trial. They're just waiting for their day in court. And 67% of people come back. Our recidivism rate is amongst the highest in the world. The reason for this is the way we make decisions. Judges have the best intentions when they make these decisions about risk, but they're making them subjectively. What we need in this space are strong data and analytics. So I went out and built a phenomenal team of data scientists and researchers and statisticians to build a universal risk assessment tool so that every single judge in the United States of America can have an objective, scientific measure of risk. And the tool that we've built, what we did was we collected 1.5 million cases from all around the United States. And we found that there were nine specific things that mattered all across the country and that were the most highly predictive of risk. Things like the defendant's prior convictions, whether they've been sentenced to incarceration, whether they've engaged in violence before, whether they've even failed to come back to court. And with this tool, we can predict three things. First, whether or not someone will commit a new crime if they're released. Second, for the first time, and I think this is incredibly important, we can predict whether someone will commit an act of violence if they're released. And that's the single most important thing that judges say when you talk to them. And third, we can predict whether someone will come back to court. And every single judge in the United States of America can use it because it's been created on a universal data set. So, and we've been talking about the Moneyball side of this, and Moneyball's great. Everyone loves Moneyball. But we haven't talked about the Minority Report side of this, which is a little bit darker. Yep. Because earlier in the show, we were talking about algorithmic bias. And Joy Bilamwini pointed out, you know, the more sinister side of algorithms, especially in predictive policing. Like, you could say, for example, that, you know, in most American cities, low-level crimes might involve a young man between the ages of, of 17 and 25 probably a young man of color because men of color are more likely to be arrested than white men doing the same crimes. And you could give that kind of statistic in theory to a police department and they could say, okay, we've got to focus our efforts on policing 17 to 25 year old men of color. And that opens up a whole nother set of problems. Yeah. So here's how I would think about it. And I'll come back to the data bias in a moment. But I think the first question is, can we accept the current system as it is? And I would argue that the answer is no. 
you know, we have the highest rate of incarceration in the world. We spend $280 billion a year. We have 70 or 80 million Americans who now have criminal arrest records. Mm -hmm. We are not as smart about how we use resources in a cost-effective way, and we are not as fair or equitable. The second point is that we really don't know a lot of what we're doing. This lack of information is simply unacceptable to me. It's really hard for me to understand how criminal justice could be a space where we just leave it to gut and instinct. Now, the bias piece, I am someone who believes that virtually all data is biased, that there is bias in data. The question to me is not whether or not we should use data in criminal justice, it's how we should use data. The standard for technology and for data is not perfection, it's is it better? It's can we make an improvement upon our current system? I mean, can we get to a place quickly where we can gather enough data, enough statistics to actually create a more just criminal justice system, a, a full 360 system that actually treats everybody equitably? We have to. We need to start pulling the data. We need to start understanding what's happening. Um, and we need to start thinking about this, but we have to understand what's happening, who's in our system, what are our outcomes, um, and how do we actually make the public safer? How do we reduce crime? And I think, you know, we're not doing a very good job right now unless we start embracing data and thinking about how and when we use it. Ann Milgram, she's the former attorney general of New Jersey and now a professor at the NYU School of Law. You can see her full talk at TED.com. Hey, thanks for listening to our show, Can We Trust the Numbers, this week. If you want to find out more about who is on it, go to ted.npr.org. To see hundreds more TED Talks, check out ted.com or the TED app. And you can listen to this show anytime by subscribing to our podcast. You can do it right now on Apple Podcasts or however you get your podcasts. Our production staff at NPR includes Jeff Rogers, Sanaz Meshkanpour, Janae West, Neva Grant, Rund Abdel Fattah, Casey Herman, and Rachel Faulkner, with help from Daniel Shukin and Benjamin Klempe. Our intern is Deba Motasham. Our partners at TED are Chris Anderson, Colin Helms, Anna Phelan, and Janet Lee. If you want to let us know what you think about the show, you can write us at TEDRadioHour at NPR.org. You can tweet us. It's at TEDRadioHour. I'm Guy Raz, and you've been listening to Ideas Worth Spreading right here on the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Thanks for listening to and supporting NPR Podcasts. To view the entire NPR Podcast catalog, 